to accomplish our God-given destiny, we're going to have to go against the flow of this world system. You are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Welcome to session number five. We are going to be talking about forging both warriors and swords. And the reason why we're covering these together is the process is unfortunately very, very similar. I'm going to open up with the story of a samurai sword. And I actually don't have one, so we're going to just drop one in by video. My family thinks I'm too fierce to be provided with a samurai sword. But the samurai sword is a really interesting sword. Samurai warriors, they practiced what was called the way of the warrior, which was designated as freedom without fear. And think about that, how powerful that is. The opposite of freedom without fear would be fear without freedom. But the samurais, they took it a little, little further. They decided that they were so into their swords that they actually named each of their swords. And they believed that each of the sword actually carried the spirit of that name. So they might name this sword courage. And they would believe that courage, the spirit of courage was attached to this sword. But then it went a little further and they decided to begin to worship swords. And so they went a little far with it, which is just kind of interesting because it's kind of a perversion of what God does. See, we don't have swords with spirits. We have the sword of the spirit. But I do think we need to embrace the way of the samurai, which is freedom without fear. And any warrior has to be perfected in this dimension of freedom without fear. You need to understand there is a very, very ancient struggle. And the struggle didn't start on earth. It actually started in heaven. But things that begin as battles in heaven, they begin to come into the earth because everything in heaven is invading earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it's not unusual that we begin to see the struggles between light and dark that were in heaven between the archangels and the fallen angels. And then now we're seeing it on earth. And I want to read to you a little bit of understanding. When we look at scriptures, we need to know who was the first warrior. And we find in Genesis 10, 8, Cush, was the ancestor of Nimrod, who was the first heroic warrior on earth. This designation of on earth means that there very well was already warrior on heaven. So in heaven there was warriors and now on earth there begins to be heaven. Designation of first means preeminent as far as on earth. But we also see in Revelations 12, which is just a window of back, forth, back, forth. We see now a war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for him in heaven. And that's Revelations 12, seven through eight. That is what happened. And now we have what is happening because of this fallout. Satan was not just defeated in heaven. He was displaced from heaven. And now that battle that happened in heaven is being continued on earth. The passage reveals that Michael is the mightiest of all the warring angels. And it's interesting because the name Michael actually means one who is like God. And our God is a man of war. It doesn't say he's just... He's sometimes at war in certain situations, but we learn that our Father God 
is a man of war. He's actually the original warrior because anything that is, is actually created in his image. And I'm actually trying to find my scripture. Exodus 15, three. This is the first time you see God begin to fight on behalf of his people. It says the Lord is a warrior, not sometimes fights. The Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. And Yahweh is not the name of Jesus. Yahweh is the name of God. God is a man of war. God is love. God is a consuming fire. We saw that he fought as that consuming fire on behalf of the Israelites, that he blocked the Egyptians passage. And then he led the same, you know, warrior God led them through the wilderness. But Yahweh, our Holy Father is the original warrior. And so I need something to be settled here. You're not a warrior daughter because there's a war. You're a warrior daughter because that's your DNA, because your father is a man of war. And so it is your lineage. So this fight is personal. This is about your family and the family of darkness, child of light, child of dark. This is between good and evil evil. And so I want to actually contrast some of these things because we don't really know that many warriors, what we know are soldiers. And I'm not speaking in terms when I say soldiers of our armed forces, I'm talking about the concept of a soldier and the concept of a warrior, because God is looking for warriors, not soldiers. And let me just give you some different comparisons and contrasts. First of all, soldiers are trained as our warriors but there's an additional training that goes into the warriors. Soldiers are trained, warriors are tempered. All soldiers take orders, but only warriors know what the spirit of that order is. I was talking to one of my sons and they said, you know, all soldiers can follow orders, but why they get promoted to be a leader or a general or a strategist is when they understand what needs to happen for that order to be obeyed. So it isn't just about the order, it's about the spirit of that order. So when you decide that you are willing to be a warrior, you go through an additional process. You aren't just trained, you're tempered. And we need to be people that understand that God is asking us to be that. Soldiers who enlist are all paid, but warriors are made. It isn't about how much they're paid. They're going to be a warrior, no matter what the rank is, no matter what their pay scales, they are going to be a warrior. Actually, no organization can assign you this rank. This is a rank that we earn in the spirit through God. And, and we need to understand this is a question of honor. When you deal the difference between soldiers and warriors, you always find the question of honor. Honor, honor, honor. Honor is honor bound when you talk about warriors. Soldiers are usually duty bound. They're going to enlist for a certain season of time, but warriors are seasoned with time. They go through it and they grow through every single season. Psalm 45, 11, you know, and I, I I, what, they're going to put it up for you. But one of the things it says, the king is enthralled with your beauty. Honor him. He is your Lord. How do we honor God? We honor him by valuing what he values. And we need to understand that everything in our culture weaves dishonor. It wants us to dishonor our bodies with immodesty, impropriety, obesity, eating disorders. And yet we need to be people that begin to honor our bodies because we want our bodies to honor God. Mm -hmm. And honor understands that I present my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Our warrior king, he is magnificent. He is beautiful beyond compare. But we need to understand that we are going to war for his behalf and we are going to war in a different capacity. I already said soldiers are trained and warriors are tempered, but I need to talk to you about that tempering. I believe the tempering is actually our response to fear. Fear blinds us. And so many people are blinded by fear. They don't understand how to navigate the fear factor. And again, I said it to you before, you know what? It's not about being, you know, always brave, meaning never being afraid. It's about being brave longer. Just 
going through the test. And some of that is a endurance thing. And so I've got, you know, I've got a lot of areas because we're going to be covering two things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that warriors are driven by what is unseen, why soldiers react by what is seen. So for example, a warrior might go out like Joshua and Caleb and say, okay, this is what I see. The people are huge. Their produce is few, huge. We're small, you know, but God is able because they fight with what isn't. Soldiers come back with a status report. Warriors do not come back with a status report of what is. They come back with a status report of what could be. And so there are always people that are prophetically minded. They're always looking through God's eyes of what would God bring to this solution? What would he bring? So they have an internal drive on them. Soldiers will follow orders to the letter, which would mean sometimes they're like, oh yeah, we only said to that. So I just stopped there. Warriors will follow the spirit of the order, which means they will do over and above. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, good men must not obey laws too well. And he was talking about what was happening in America and that there are certain things that when we obey laws too well, we actually become you know, prisoners of what is not just and what is not right. And our whole nation was set up about people saying, you know, these kind of things aren't right. We're not going to, we're not going to obey them well. Different things about warriors and different things about soldiers is soldiers can only the number the armies that they see. We have the story of Elijah, who really was a warrior prophet. I mean, he had this ability to see armies surrounding him. I'm, I don't believe that God would surround him with armies if he wasn't a warrior. And so he always understood that greater those with it with us, numbers, chariots, whatever, than there are those with. And he prayed. He prayed. He said, God, open my servant's eyes that he might see. And this has been my prayer that as we begin to step out, as we begin to speak in faith, that God is going to actually open our eyes and we're going to get glimpses of greater who is with us or with our God. And our God is more than able than those that are in the earth. And so we have these different stories, but um, a warrior never retri retires. It is a status. It is a, a bearing that they're going to have their entire life. And they are going to be people that are going to do whatever. But where a warrior begins is not on the field of battle. Warriors are made in private battles. Mm -hmm. They are made in private battles when nobody yeah. else is watching. Mm -hmm. And what begins in private will end up forging and tempering their life for what is in front of other people. I'm just going to say this. I know a lot of you are going through stuff and you say, well, okay, I, you know, I probably shouldn't, I didn't handle that well, but I, it's okay. I'll, I'll just go on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something. We need to understand that warriors treat every single battle as though it matters. There is no small battle. There are only battles. And the way you win is very crucial. Not just that you win, but the way of a warrior is the way that you win. And so we need to be people who understand we go from victory to victory when we win well. And that doesn't necessarily mean we cause other people to lose. So we need to understand what that looked like. And if you're thinking, I've gone through a ton of battles. I can't believe you're talking about this and I have done it well, but nobody knows. Nobody ever said, God never wastes a private victory. It will come forward into your future. So in contrast to weapons and lives, I'm going to want you to not separate these. We're going to talk about how what forges a life is actually the same thing that forges a sword, pressure, heat, and water. We are washed in the water of the word. We come under pressure of circumstances and we just have to choose how we will respond to those. And then the fire that begins to have that heat in our life to bring out hardship. One of the quotes says that struggling is strengthening. I don't like that. I want somebody to like put those electrodes on my body that just make my muscles contract with like me watching psych episodes, but that's not going to happen. It says struggling is strengthening. We build muscles under pressure. And I want to talk to you a little bit about this and how God uses pressures. Isaiah 43 verses one to two says, fear not. And again, can I just say, always fear not. Always fear not. Before any promise can come, from heaven to earth, fear 
has to be addressed. You can't hear it right if you hear it through a spirit of fear. So God is always saying, fear not. He's saying, I didn't give this spirit to you. Listen, listen, listen. This isn't about fear. This is about courage. He said, I'm encouraging you. Fear not. I have redeemed you. And, and if he, you think, yeah, you redeem everybody. He goes, okay, wait, let's make it more personal. I have called you by name. Mm -hmm. Then he says, you're mine. You're not the enemies. You don't belong to death and destruction. You don't belong to failure. You're mine. When you pass through the waters, can I just be honest with you? It doesn't say if you. It doesn't say if. It says when you pass through the waters, I will be with you and through the rivers. So like it starts with waters like, oh, when you cross the stream and when you go through what looks like it could drown you, they will not overwhelm you. When you, not if you, when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. It's never an if, it's a mm -hmm. when. Mm -hmm. But if you understand that we're adopted by God, it's always a pass through. One of my favorite quotes by Winston Churchill is, if you are going through hell, keep going. You don't camp there. You don't think that what you're in right now is where you are staying. You go through. You keep walking. You stay consistent. You keep praying. You keep moving forward no matter what is going on in your life. When I was writing this book, I I sent a poll out again because I, I, I just totally love social media because you can get a pulse on certain things. And I said, what are your fires right now? What are your waters that seem to overwhelm you? What are your three greatest challenges that you are going through? And when I tallied them, relational challenges was at the very top. Relational challenges. You know what? I have to say, this sounds really stupid. It doesn't matter what you go through with your mother and father if you find out you've been adopted and you're his. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you have something you can stand on. You know, it doesn't matter if your husband leaves you and you're divorced. I'm not saying it doesn't matter to like your heart. I'm just saying the truth is that your God is your husband and he'll never leave you. I mean, there's always something that trumps this, but relational challenges with spouse, siblings, children, leaders, friends. So many people were lonely because they weren't married. And I'm just telling you, if you are a single woman and you are watching for a man, and you are waiting for him to come into your life and change things, you know what? You might be building for a life you don't want. Mm -hmm. If I were you, I'd find out who I was. I'd build up who I was. And then you just might find while you're plowing your field, someone's going to come alongside of you and they're going to tap you. But you need to understand you use this season of struggling for strengthening. Yeah goes on financial challenges resulting from unemployment, credit card, and other debt due to unwise purchases or health issues, challenges in fighting life purposes, uh, the daily disciplines to pursue what is in their heart, troubles that are self-inflicted, and trials that are God-backed. It's interesting that a lot of the credit card debt, people saying, I can't find purpose, but that's why they do credit card because they don't feel any purpose. So they buy things to feel like they have purpose or they expect people to meet all their needs. Mm -hmm. So really, to be honest with you, problem one and problem two would be solved if problem three was right. Mm -hmm. If you know who you are, if you know the purpose of God in your life, then you'll be able to make it. You know, I'm 52 years of age and I've learned a long time ago that you don't have to know what you're called to do. You don't know, have to know where you're called to live. If you know who you are in God, you will find your way. You will find your way. So lessons that we learn are often uncomfortable. And to be honest with you, the more personal the battle, the more awkward it is, but also the more personal the battle, the more enduring the victory because it's yours. Mm -hmm. Somebody else didn't do it for you. And now I'm going to preach to you out of my least favorite book in the Bible, it is the book of James. And in the book of James, we find basically how God forges people into swords, how God forges our lives. And I'm going to read it to you out of the message. It opens up with, consider a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. Seriously? I mean, that sounds really pretty, but has anybody lived that? I mean, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides, I've never woken up and said, what? a gift. 
If I am going through something hard, I'm going to call one of my friends and say, you do not understand what I'm going through right now. It seems like my world is falling apart. It's like I feel like I am surrounded, the, ca the roof's caving in, the rug's been pulled out from underneath me. And if my friend said, let's just count this pure joy, not mixed with any sorrow, let's sing a hymn unto the Lord. I would hang up and I would call somebody that would get mad with me. I would call my friend Christine because she's Greek and she would be mad and we would be mad together. But guess what? Obviously God looks at this very differently because our God considers ambushes without any means of escape to be opportunities. It goes on to say, you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. I know that. I know that under pressure, I cry out for and I cry out to the things that I have faith in. Mm -hmm. You know, we live here in Colorado and we have a growing season of possibly three weeks. It is cold so many of the months. We have blizzards on record in May, some even in June. The only month without a blizzard on record for the state of Colorado is July. And so if you want to grow certain types of bulbs and flowers, you have to create an artificial environment for them. You have to put them in your refrigerator drawer and say, rest easy, my friends. You are having a mild winter. When outside, that is a blatant lie. It is a nightmare outside, but you put them into that drawer and they think it's a temperate winter. Then when it should be spring, you put them up on the windowsill. The sun comes through. The warmth makes them begin to bloom. And then when they, you know it's safe, you bring them outside. What am I doing? It's called forcing something to bloom. See, I know that there's been a lot of hardship, but I think God is trying to cause his people to bloom under pressure. And he is creating artificial climates and environments so that what is in you will learn to bloom under pressure. We are in a season where God needs you to bring forth fruit in every season, not just in easy seasons, not just in springtime, but in every season. It goes on to say, so don't try to get out of anything prematurely. And I haven't told you guys yet, but I'm a grandmother. And there's a couple of things about grandmothers you need to know. One of those are, we don't lie. We might be confused about what is truth, but we don't lie about big life issues. And I'm going to tell you, yeah, you, you, it says don't try to get out of prematurely. It means you, you actually can. You can actually opt out. But I'm going to tell you something about life. Life is a series of tests. And you can opt out of this test, but then you're going to take the retest. And the retest is always harder. Stay the course. So don't get out of it. It says, let it do its work so you can become mature and well-developed and not deficient in any way. We have a body right now who runs away instead of maturing. We have a body right now that leaves churches as soon as there is pressure. We have a body right now that is immature and not well-developed. Maybe we've got strong arms and weak legs. Maybe we have big mouths and, and no, no hands. I don't know what it is, but we need to begin to do whatever we need to do to flourish under pressure. He goes on to say, if you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. Can I just say in my Bible, it says, since you don't know what you're doing. To be honest with you, we're really in a season where none of us really know what we're doing. We're kind of making this up as we go along. We're going places that nobody else has ever been before. There is no map to where we are going. We are prophetic people and we're going to have to look up to go forward. And so since we don't know what we're doing, we need to pray to the Father. He loves to help. He isn't like, seriously, Shelly, I've told you how to do this so many times. I can't believe you're praying again. He is saying, I want to help. I want to get involved. What is going to be in front of us is going to take God's involvement, this, his partnership with us. And it won't be condescended to. The King James says, abradeth not, which just sounds like he's going to undo your hair. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying he won't make you feel bad that you asked for it. And it says, ask boldly, believingly, without a second thought. You know, 
Moses was bold. Mm -hmm. Abraham was bold. Hezekiah, when God told me he was going to die, he was like, okay, let me just talk about this. They had bold state. Jesus was bold. He wasn't wimpy and whiny and whispering. He spoke out loud, asked boldly, believingly, without a second thought. When you've got that first thought and it feels like an explosion in you, then you need to say, God, your word says, I am going to have children who are disciples taught of the Lord and great is their peace and undisturbed composure. You don't say, God, please. This world is so bad. Kanye is so, so nasty. I just don't even know how my children are going to get saved. You don't pray according to the songs out there. You pray according to the word. You anchor your prayers to the eternal word of God. You do not react to our culture. I told my children when they were little, they were for signs and wonders and miracles. I made them put their armor on every night. They were like, can we just be normal children who put on their pajamas? I was like, you are not normal. You are disciples taught of the Lord and great is your peace. And they were like, oh. <laughs> but you know what happens when you do that? You send legacy, the arrows of God word into your children's future. And then they pick them up and they shoot those same arrows into their children's future. You know, what was annoying to my children when they were little, they are now doing with their children. So shoot the arrow of God's word. It will meet you and them in the future in strength. It says people who worry their prayers, that's reacting to our culture, are like wind whip waves. Don't think you're going to get anything from the master that way. Adrift at sea, keeping all your options open. God option, no option. Prayerlessness or bold prayer. Believingly, we are going to be a people who are going to say, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go all the way out on the limb and jump off if I need to, but I am going to declare the word of God in light and strength. No matter what the fire does, I'm going to keep going through it and I'll come out refined. No matter what the water looks like, I'm going to pass through it clean and pure because I did it right on the other side. I am going to be a warrior who walks in freedom without fear.